remember when I first met Nina Pili seven years ago, her reputation had preceded her. She was a dazzling new planet on the social firmament. But underneath that effervescence lay an astute mind, very focused. Nina was the prized wife of the corporate tycoon Rajan Pili, who ran a 1400 crore empire spanning six countries. Rajan adored Nina. They were best friends, lovers, soulmates. Looking back for the Pillies, those were the Camelot years. Success can be heady and heedless at times. The Pillies steamrolled ahead. All too soon, admiration turned to envy and then to resentment. The Pillies discovered the changing face of the goddess called Fortune and the extent to which she seduces the very people she's striving to cheat. But no one, no one could have foreseen the end. Oh, may God look after you better, my darling. <coughs> oh, may God. May God give you the chance to break me back. Today I know the last act has not been played. For who can measure the infinite strength of a woman. Meet Nina Pile. The world is rushing by so fast. Let's press the pause and make it last. Before you became Nina Pele? I was a young daughter of a naval officer and Sydney I came from a very traditional South Indian home in Kerala actually but um, as you know Kerala is matriarchal mm. so my father always encouraged me to be as strong as my brother to do as well at school and I was very good at school I sort of uh, was I like, can believe that. <laughs> no, I knew. <laughs> and I did my um, bachelor's degree and honors, you know, with honors uh, from Baroda University. And then I came to Bombay University for my master's degree. What was the first job that you ever took? I um, was very keen to get into some sort of a glamour profession, you mm. know. And so I started with a little modeling. And I did a campaign for Bimal and, and I did one for Bombay Dying about two weeks later. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were your aspirations at that time? What were your dreams for yourself, for your life? I always felt I'd be someone special, but, you know, in the sense, and I thought it'd be more academic than, than social or, uh, you know, I thought it'd be more intellectual and more sort of uh, to do with, with the qualifications I had. Life takes different turns, you know. Absolutely. So how did you uh, how did you meet Rajan? Oh, it was those those, those few days that I had um, for work experience at the Taj. Rajan was one of the VIP guests, and you're supposed to remember their rooms by heart, you know. And I thought, gosh, I'm just here for a month. Why should I remember anyone's room as well? <laughs> so he walked up to me. Can I have my key, please? I said, What's your room number? And he said his room and so what's your name? You know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Com <sacrilege. laughs> yeah, completely taken aback. And then he said, how long have you been here? And I said, a couple of weeks. And he said, uh, oh, well, I'm leaving tomorrow, tonight or something, you know, but I'll see you on my next visit. And I said, oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to be here. Oh. So what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to fly off. I'm taking a job with British Airways. But don't tell him. <laughs> that's, what that's what I'm going to be doing. So he said, oh, here's my card. And then he gave me his card and he said, British Airways flies to Singapore, so you know, you must keep in touch with me. And I said, great, I'll you know. And I lost the address book while I was in England. Actually, at a friend's home, 
But three years or two and a half years later, he found it and gave it back to me. And then I established contact with the Aunt Elaine. How long, how long later did you get married to him? We got married two and a half years oh, right. after we met. But uh, um, it was quite interesting because we had to make it look like it was an arranged marriage for our parents that you know someone had proposed <laughs> we, but we were both from from kerala in the same community and, and he he used to say that if his parents had gone out looking for a girl it would probably have been me and you know, okay. you know it was all it just worked it know? worked and then um and then came what i call the camelot years at yes, the time the, they were special years yeah absolutely what, what was it like can you tell me about it um, it actually we you know Rajan wanted to expose me to everything that he'd seen and done which is a wonderful way to learn so from learning about wines and food and restaurants and the veneer part to the very basic tenants that we had between us that we we hardly ever fought because we we we'd sort of prearranged that if he was in a temper then I had to be cool and you know if okay. I was in a and he almost never was in a temper, so I always got away with, <laughs> with it. So I felt it was one of the best agreements anyway. And but we had that, that basic, um, you know, admiration for each other. And then it translated to just having a good time otherwise. And, mm. and we worked very hard, Simi, you know, when I married Rajan. At the time, he told me, he said, sweetheart, I don't have that much money or, you know, mm. but we thought alike, we, we mm. enjoyed the things and he was just, just so loving and generous and I said, gosh, you know, we can make it together, you know, whatever mm. it is that you Very do. Very indulgent I, of you. Totally. Mm. And that's what I mean. I'm you sure. Know, I, uh, you know, I'd have, I'm sure I would have, in, you know, compacted a lot more into my life if I'd known it was only going to be 15 years that I already had him. Were you involved in his business as well? Or? Yeah, I was on every single board that, that, that Rajan was on and, you know, I was a shareholder of all his companies and I'd definitely say I was an equal, but um, being that much younger, he consulted with me more for intuitive, mm. you know, wom woman's intuition, and, and, and then tried to translate that into a okay. business. Um, and a lot of the times, um, intuition had no place to play in business. So I must admit I was, I was right about people, you know. Were you? Yes. I was very perceptive about people, and uh, Rajan always turned a blind eye. Nina, I mean, things looked perfect. Mm -hmm. It was, people envied you. When, when did things start going wrong? I mean, it's difficult to say exactly when, but um, I'd say that, that, that the rise was, you know, uh, meteoric uh, between 89 and, say, 92. And there was a lot of envy and jealousy, and there was, there was a lot of bad blood, you know, where friends turned enemies, and... Perhaps he trusted the wrong people. Maybe we brought in the wrong partners. And um, that went wrong because people had designs on those companies which didn't quite marry with ours. But when you say friends turned enemies, why did you let them become enemies? I guess there was a certain naivety in that you didn't think they'd be, become enemies to the extent that they did because in our world it was, you know, an enemy who was someone that perhaps that you just didn't talk to or weren't in touch with anymore. And because all, all your friends were people who were doing very well for themselves. Yeah. It's not that they had any less or, or, or desired more. Everybody was equal. Were they, did they feel crossed? Even if they did, it's a bit strange that they should end up with the companies that we had if they didn't want any more, you know. I mean, it's a bit strange that they should not want anything more and it suddenly lands on their plate. No. They may have had a lot, but they thought Rajan perhaps had more, and they wanted to get more. So it's, it's all a question of greed and more and less. And you know, we never equated ourselves in those, those you know, in, in all those the lexicons of the wealthy. You know. But corporate battles take place all over the world. Mm -hmm. They don't have tragic ends like this. Well, the tragic end was murder, Simi. I mean, I have a case in court now 
uh, there's, there's a CBI investigation that's been ordered by the Chief Metropolitan Magistrate, and it has to do with 302, which is murder. So uh, perhaps there was a design to get him where he died, which is in jail, and he was there only for three days. We have adequate proof that he was given diazepam injections, which, which a cirrhotic patient should never be given. Uh, and they gave vast quantities of it. It's, it was part of the Leela Safe inquiry. The reports come out, and it, it clearly blames the doctors, the jailers, and a lot of other people. But it was not like, I mean, there, there hasn't been another case, because there wasn't a vicious enough enemy who wanted to have him finished in jail. And those are the kind of people we were dealing with. They, they were not human. You know, they had extraordinary uh, reach and power, and they would go to any lengths. And so did you. You also had a lot of power, a lot of imp important friends. But we never thought that that this sort of viciousness existed. You know, I mean, we never thought to the point of death, to the point of harassment. Yeah. You know, there were vested interests who ensured that that there was a order passed. And the order where Raja was accused of cheating in Singapore, which is white collar crime at worst, you know. When, we, when he landed here, he was accused of larceny, bribery, and forgery, which he'd never committed. Now, who added words like that? You tell me. Can, can, can a citizen just be picked off the street mm -hmm. and, and accused of three crimes he's never committed and be put in jail? Well, that's exactly what happened to Rajan. He was so prominent. He did have powerful friends. But I guess the people at the time had more powerful friend, friends or perhaps paid more. Mm. But how did events snowball so, so fast? You know, in Kerala, he got bail, and he was, you know, there was support from the people, the press was, he should never have left Kerala, but friends and other well-wishers at the time said that, no, you should come to Delhi and surrender yourself, and nothing will happen to you, and, you know, you haven't committed any crime, and, you know, we'll have a retrial in India, and sort of all kinds of promises that, of course, never materialized. And there were some powerful friends who did suggest things like that, that that was all taken care of, and... Uh, in the sense that he was innocent. I mean, if he was, even if he was uh, uh, guilty, it needed a review. And ha at his, I mean, I've basically denying a man medical yeah. health is, is just not done. But then medicating him with the wrong medicine, you know, he was beaten, beaten up in jail in his stomach, where his liver is. And, and he kept telling me, they're going to kill me, you know, in Malayalam, you know, and I thought that the system or, you know, the, I didn't get the exact, mm. you know, and, and I was the only one that was on the outside that was fighting for him. So I guess in many ways, you know, he was a quiet, reticent sort of, I mean, he bore a lot. Mm. So he, um, he, he even tried to show his, his, his stomach, but no one wanted to see, no one wanted to hear. And uh, they said, oh, this is all part of jail, Mrs. Pillay. And, you know, I mean, we were just shocked, you know. You know, we, yeah. when you're at a, I don't know, maybe, you know, he'd never even been hit as a child. Mm. Me, you know, for... And I've never been physically assaulted. So I guess beating, you know, the jail kind of, I mean, I had no idea, yeah. you know. After Rajan died, we really got to know how. But you must have felt so helpless because you couldn't really do anything to, to get him out or to protect ah, him there. It was the worst days of my life. Really, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. But didn't you seek intervention from some friends? Oh, we, oh I did. I called everyone. What happened? I, or every friend of mine. What did they of, say? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Just a stone wall. You know, I mean, everyone said they were doing something. But it was as if they all knew <laughs> what was perhaps going to happen, that maybe we had very powerful people that were work, working against us. When was the last time you talked to Rajan? It was... Um, The day that uh, he got to know that he wouldn't get medical relief, and they, you know, he'd heard that in the courtroom. But I rushed to the the jail at the court, and we had maybe five or ten minutes before the bus took him back to jail. And, and uh, he said, "I wouldn't last, Shivipai," and we were standing together. But there were about forty policemen, just about ten or fifteen feet away. And he said, I won't last. I don't think I'm going to live. And, and he said, I love you very much. And take care of yourself. And in front of all these strangers, he just reached over and kissed me on my lips, which 
completely shocked me because he was just such a private person and he'd never ever made a public gesture like that. But that was the last night, the day before he died. And less than 24 hours later, I, he died. But you couldn't know that the end would come so soon. No, but uh, and I actually saw him breathing his last for me because I was standing at the gate of the jail itself, you know, the cells, you know, the thing, and I was looking through this little peephole, and uh, I saw him as 68, you know, his chest was heaving, I was screaming to anyone, everyone to help. The drama went on for about two and a half, three hours, and absolutely nothing. You know. You, you couldn't get him to a hospital. Nobody could get him to a hospital in time. Mm, no. And then when we got there, he got no kind of real help because he was already in a coma. But you know, they, none of their machines were working in the hospital. There was just, I mean, the, the doctors were trying, but there was just no equipment. And you know, it was like being back in the Middle Ages. You know, they were trying to work with their bare hands. Young doctors who did try, but it just wasn't good enough. You know. When I look back, I realize how helpless I was. But I can still feel that. I do still feel that very alone, vulnerable, and yeah. helpless. You feel let down and bitter about those people who didn't help you when you needed their help. I don't feel bitterness or anger. Mm -hmm. I would like truth, the truth to come out because truth is very important. I mean, Rajan fought for it, he lived for it. And I think till we have the truth, I can't even tell my sons what happened because it's not the truth, you know. What did you tell your children? I didn't have to tell them. It was on television, it was, it was on the newspapers. How did you explain it to them? Not immediately, Simi. I just had to tell them their father was no more and the baby was just one and a half years old. You know, there was, and Krish. He must have asked why. Yeah, he did. He just saw me so broken that he just, you know, seemed to grow up suddenly and he became a pillar of strength. And he's, you know, I guess a, 11 year old boy that performs the funeral rites of his father just becomes a man, you know, there's just mm. no other way. So. But as a woman, what has been hardest adjusting to for you? What, what makes life that much harder now? Ah, just putting a face on pain and sadness, and, you know, and, and trying to jolly oneself along. And, try and wear a little colour or some jewellery because my children, they, my son, especially my older one, remembers me from before and he just, you know, and, and little things, trying to be strong and where you were dependent, trying to cope where you don't even know how to, you know, and just taking each day as it comes and, and trying to submerge the pain and the tears which for women, you know, we, we, that's the way we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. And trying to be a little more stoical and strong and, and trying to cope in what's definitely a man's work. Mm. This must have left lifelong scars on you. But I still want to ask you, after such an experience, what lessons has life taught you? What have you learned from all this? that you never take anything for granted. People still perceive you as a social person, as a jet-setting social person. Is this aspect important to you? You know, this, this I don't think my sari or, or my jewelry or anything can reflect the pain inside, but equally I don't believe that one needs to show it in any way, you know. But still, there has to be some normalcy. And, um, Certainly a journey of pain doesn't have to be in perpetuity. No one wants to have a sad, depressed person around me. It's a lesson I learned right up in the beginning. You know, I'm certain that I will always be true to Rajan's memory and, and to the love I had for him. So. 
you know, would you go through your life all over again, the same pain, the same loss, the same love, the same high points, the same joys? Would you do Gosh, it again? Gosh, not the pain, Simi. No, I don't wish this pain on anyone. But taking in all the joys as well, the high points? Yeah, but it could have been a life, lifetime of high points. Why did it have to be different for me? There's so many women who, you know, have the same and they continue to have the same. Death leaves so much unfinished and unsaid. I'm aware of that. Is there something you wish that he could know or that you, you wish you had told him? Or? You know, Simi, I think the tragedy was bad enough, but, you know, I flew on the same plane with Rajan's coffin in the hold. And I think that was really painful, you know, that he was just, you know, and I was on the plane and he was just... I think I spoke to him a lot on that journey, you know, from Delhi to Goa and to Kerala, to, to, to London. And there will always be things that, that I want to say to him. But I talk to him. <laughs> Nina, in the balance, have there been more tears or more laughter in your life? Ah, oh, there's one tear just going down now. Um, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, I'd say I'd like to jolly myself along too, you know, I mean, I could easily just make it all day. But the tears are overwhelming, especially in the last two years and four months, as it will be tomorrow. Uh, it's sad. Mm. Can I just compose myself? Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. How do you see your future, Nina? So, me, I joined the BJP last year in, in July in Kerala. If I can do something more than just just be, be just a voice or, or be someone that suffered a personal tragedy, I should try and do it. And so I thought a good place to start was to try and fight for change within the system from your own experience. When I fought the last election, I met people who women who'd gone through what I realized was perhaps a lot more than me, you know, and they had nothing and they had no one and, and they had three young daughters and, you know, I've got two sons, you know. So it's like, you know, a man who doesn't have shoes and, you know, and then he's someone, someone without, without any without feet, yes. Feet. Would you ever think of marrying again? No, Simi, I think that for me means changing my name and I don't ever want to change my name. I want to be Mrs. Sergeant Pillay or feel this way till the day I die. I... And there'll never be another Raja. So... Well, Nina, I know that for you and your sons there is an irreplaceable void. I just hope that it can be filled with some joy in your life. Thank you for this rendezvous.